Rodney, will you come with your guest, please? Uh, we have two wonderful young men visiting with us tonight. Rodney has, has been in this platform before. Rodney was a drug addict in Boston uh, and a pusher and a devil <laughs> full of hell. Skinny, about dead, and Lord saved him, called him to preach. He's a missionary now down in Ecuador. Uh, it's Ecuador. Uh, in introduce this young man, if you will, please. This is Gustavo Arrevalos. He was one of the first guys that came into the Teen Challenge program by way of the first guy that was saved and delivered in the prison ministry in Paraguay. He heard of his friend, a drug, a drug trafficker. He went to visit him in prison, and he said, i got to get what this guy has. Came to the Teen Challenge ministry over five years ago, never read the Bible before in his life, accepted the Lord Jesus Christ in his life, has never turned back. He's gone forward. He's been at my right hand uh, ever since. He graduated Bible school while working full-time in ministry. He's received his official credentials as a minister of the Assemblies of God in Paraguay. But uh, the Lord gave us the privilege to be able to come through New York. And what I shared with Pastor Dave was that I want him to have the same privilege that I had over 20 years ago. And I remember like it was yesterday when Brother Dave put his hands on me and said, Lord, give him the same spirit that you gave me. And I want you to know I believe in having a, par a parental lineage. And I know what line I'm from. <laughs> And I thank God for that. I'm proud of that. And I believe that God answered that prayer because for the last 22 years, my life has been used as the Lord to reach out to other addicts and other guys that were in the same shape I was. And he's one of the evidences. Praise the Lord. I uh, understand he's going to pastor your church down there. Gustavo's going to be in charge of, he is in charge right now of the day-to-day -day operations of the church. And when Lynn and I and my family finish our term in a year, uh, and we come back on furlough, he will be the one who carries out this ministry uh, into the future and has the confidence that I know that he'll do a good job. Now, one other thing before we anoint him and pray over him. Uh, we had a team just visit you. Uh, one of our elders, uh, Ignatius, was there. Tell, you told me this afternoon about the story of the man with a gun. Two incredible miracles. And for you, for the team that came, we received the best of the best. There were eight... And I know that the prayers of this church behind them made a big difference because really their visit was with signs and wonders. Two miracles occurred. One, and probably more than that, but two that I can tell you about tonight. There was a man that, that came to my office as the team was out on the streets. He told me that he had a pistol to his head that morning. He wasn't a believer. He was a God-fearer. God spoke to him and said, don't do it. I've got a plan for your life, and I'm going to show it to you today. And he put the pistol down, and as he walked out on the street, one of the team going by with the literature distribution handed him our tract, which is a testimony of one of the men that got saved. It has the address the, of where our center is, and he came directly there. The same morning, I mean, it was like 20 minutes after the team was still out doing literature distribution. He was downcast. He lost his family. He lost everything. And he says, I'm at my wit's end. I don't know what to do. And I got this like it was a word from God. And I said, it was. And we prayed, and he accepted Jesus into his life. He came the next day. He was out in the street meetings with us, with the team. And he came to church last Sunday. And I want you to know that his face is shining like a newborn baby. Praise the Lord. What's the other? We were working... On the streets, we were every night and doing a street meeting in a neighborhood that is made out of cardboard and wood houses, the poorest neighborhood in the city of Asuncion, La Chacarita. And I'm sure you'll be hearing the team members when they have share their testimonies. But one of the guys, and I explained to the team, like we used to always do, is to concentrate in the neighborhood, not to go and shoot everywhere. Because when you concentrate, God has a work to, he does a concentrated work in that area. And then you go Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and by Friday, somebody that was just listening on Monday is going to get saved. In this case, there was a guy that was listening from afar off. And he had heard of Teen Challenge, he had heard of Central Victoria from his friends, but he was a transvestite. And he was listening from afar off, and the next time that he was there, and I, I noticed that he was listening, he was a little bit closer, and he didn't have any makeup on, he wasn't dressed like a woman. By the last night on that we were there, he was dressed in street clothes, 
He gave his life to the Lord and he got in the bus with us and he's in the program tonight. Believe a, a new life in Jesus Christ. Pastor Carter and elders, will you come? If you will, please. We're going to pray for this young man. The Lord will make him an effective pastor and uh, use him to win many souls in Ecuador because uh, these pastors need If you'll anoint him, if you, uh, Pastor Carter, I'll appreciate it. And, and I'll pray and we'll just... Uh, Yes, you can interpret because he speaks no English. All right. Would you have him kneel, please? Have him kneel down, please. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. You kneel by him and just repeat. Lord Jesus, we lay hands on this young pastor and we anoint him with oil. And we pray, Lord Jesus, that you would give him a vision of your nature and who you are that his life will always be one that is close to you that he will be fearless Lord his life is going to be threatened he's going to go through very hard times he'll never be rich but you're going to make him rich in the knowledge of God fill him with the Holy Ghost make him a mighty soul winner make him a fire brand that will burn throughout the whole nation I'm asking you Lord Jesus that you will keep him humble and broken and open his heart to the needs of all his people now Lord bless him with the anointing and with the unction of the Holy Spirit and surround him with people who will be a strength to him. Lord, I'm asking you to give him one friend who will walk with him the rest of his life. Amen. God bless you. Amen. Okay? God bless you, son. Amen. God bless you. It's good to see you. Okay. Let him go, go down with us to here on the uh, speaker. To our visitors, welcome to New York. Welcome to Times Square Church. Amen. Welcome to the presence of the Lord. I want everybody that knows you're saved. If you know you're saved, there ought to be a smile on your face. And I want you to turn around and put a smile in everybody's face around you because I need a smiling crowd to preach this message tonight. Turn around. Everybody, everybody smiling in this house tonight. I'll tell one next I'm happy in the Lord. I'm happy in the Lord. I am happy in the Lord. <laughs> no grouches here tonight. <laughs> Got enough of them out in the street. I won't come to church and be among grouches. Amen. My message tonight, don't lose your song. Don't lose your song. <clears throat> Amen. Go to Revelation 15th chapter. I'll tell you what. Let, let's start uh, with Re uh, Revelation 14. Let's go to Revelation 14. That's the last book in the Bible for all the new converts, please. And some of the old converts. Start reading verse 1, chapter 14, Revelation. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written in their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne and before the four beasts, and the elders, no man could learn that song but the hundred and forty and four thousand which were redeemed from the earth. For they are they which have not been defiled with women. They are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. Now go to chapter 15, please, beginning to read verse 1. And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, 
seven angels having the seven plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. Now here's where we start again. Verse 2, And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name stand on the sea of glass having the harps of God. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Let's pray. Hallelujah. Lord, it's not going to be long. We are going to live this, what we have just read. We're going to be around the throne of the Lamb of God, and what a meeting that will be. Lord, we've talked about it, we've taught about it, preached about it, we've sang about it, and one day we'll be a part of it. Oh, God, but here we are in this world now walking through Babylon. And, Lord, we have to have a song. Put a song in our heart and help us, Lord, not to lose it. Speak, Lord, through your servant tonight. I humble myself before you. And I, I, I tell you before this congregation, I'm wholly dependent on you. I have resigned myself into your hands. Lord, if anything happens tonight, it's because you make it happen, because the Holy Spirit makes it happen. If this word is going to touch anybody, change anybody, encourage anybody, Holy Ghost, you have to do it, because I can't. So I give it over to you. I'll speak it. Lord, I'll yield my body, my mind, my vessel. I've prayed about it. I've sought it. Now you do the work. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now in the 14th chapter of Revelation... Uh, we're introduced to this great host of the redeemed gathered around the Lamb of God. They're gathered around. Now, it, it says there are 144,000. Now, the Jehovah Witnesses used to claim that that was their group because, you know, there were only about 40,000 when they started that theology. And then when they got to 140 and they were still evangelizing, it got a little scary, so they kind of backed away from that when they got to 200,000, and then when they got to 300,000, that thing has kind of faded away. 144,000 folks mentioned here is strictly uh, a, a Hebrew formula for multiples of 12. It just means an endless number. It has no other meaning than that. The, the 144,000... Forget some theology uh, built around the 144,000. This is just an innumerable host. Now, these are not all Jews, though redeemed Jews are going to be among them. Now, the Mount Zion referred to here now is the New Jerusalem. And, of course, you know who the Lamb is. That's the precious Savior that we celebrate. Hallelujah. That's Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now, this great multitude's gathered around the Lamb, and they are called virgins, which means they have not committed idolatry. That means that they're not spiritual adulterers. They're not worshiping gold and silver. They're wholly given. They, they are not cheating on Christ. They love him with all of their hearts. And the Bible said they follow the Lamb wherever he goes. They've been redeemed from among men. Now, they're called here the first fruits. Now, some theologians and some prophecy experts say that this is the first fruits, that these would be those who the term is called raptured. They're going to be taken out uh, of the world and they're going to stand before the Lord as the first fruits. There are others that teach that uh, these are those all who have died in the Lord from the Old Testament. Others that these are those uh, <clears throat> who are uh, going to be a special a group of dedicated, consecrated Christians that are going to be taken up first in a series of, of uh, resurrections. All we know is that these have died in the Lord. They were justified by faith. They were virgins. That means that they, they were not uh, touching anything of this world. But folks, I don't want to get... I want to, don't want to get into the theology of the 144,000. We're talking about two groups here, one in the 14th chapter and another in the 15th chapter. In the 15th chapter, there's a huge multitude there. They're standing on a sea of glass, which represents the absolute crystal purity of Jesus Christ. It means to me nothing more than they're not standing before him in their own righteousness, that they are wholly dependent on the holiness of Jesus Christ by faith. They're standing on the sea of glass. Not on, they're not standing on any of their own merits. They have no other claim. 
Now, the amazing thing, I, I don't believe that you have to figure out who they are and how they got there and when they got there. It's good enough that they're all together around the throne now. That's the whole point of it all. That one day we're going to be redeemed. If you know Jesus, you're going. Now, I don't care what, you know, I don't understand. Man, we have whole denominations built around these little details of how we're going to get there. And when and so forth. All I know is there's a trumpet going to sound. And the dead are going to be raised first from the grave. And then we that alive remain who are virgins. In other words, we love Jesus with all our heart. We don't have any other loves that compared to him. We're not, we're not loving the world or the things of the world. And we trust in his salvation. The Bible said we're going to be taken. He's going to meet us in the air and he's going to take us to the throne. And we are going to meet Jesus face to face. Now, there's a wonderful thing here. It's quite a sight that's described. This great gathering, this multitude, are all given harps, instruments. Uh, are, are probably every conceivable stringed instrument that, that could possibly imagine. Instruments we know nothing about. Now, this, this happens to be multitudes, innumerable multitudes standing before the Lamb of God gathered around him. And they're all given harps, the Bible says. Now, I've never learned to play a harp. I've wanted to harp in this church ever since we've had the doors open. <clears throat> but we've got the guitars and we've got things like that. But everybody's going to have the talent to play this thing. I've heard a hundred banjos at one time. What a sound that was. I mean, it almost lifted me out of my seat because I love banjos. Maybe he'll give me... A banjo, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not trying to be facetious, but the Bible says they all had harps. They all had instruments. And they were singing, and they were strumming on their harps and singing a song that was so overwhelming that John said it was the sound of roaring waters like thunder, a melodious thunder. Can you imagine... Mm. This multitude, uh, so overjoyed at seeing Jesus face to face, person to person. Now, I want you to know something, that Jesus is God, but he's also still man. He never gave up his manhood. That when we see him, he's going to walk among us. He has feet. He has hands. He has hair. He has eyes. He has a mouth. He has a body. He walks. He talks. He sings. He's a man in glory. And we are going to be gathered around this man who is God. He's in flesh, but he's man. And we are going to have bodies like unto his. We're going to have new bodies. You see, Brother Wilkson, this great scene, you mean we're not just spirits floating around with spirit instruments and spirit voices? No, it's a literal scene. It's an absolute literal actual scene with millions upon millions of bodies, celestial bodies. Hallelujah. Illuminated by the light of his holiness. I don't know, and folks... There are going to be no angels leading this. We're all going to know when to start, and we're going to have a song. And it's a particular song. Folks, not everybody going to be singing Times Square Church style, and then over here is Brooklyn Tabernacle singing their song, and over here is somebody else singing their song. It's one song. But... It's a song you learned here. I'm going to prove it to you. And if you don't learn it here, you're not going to be able to sing it there. Because they sang the song of Moses. The Lord told us the song and he's given us the words. I believe in a literal scene when God, I, the, the, the leaders of, of this great gathering will be musicians right out of this earth who have wholly given themselves to the Lord, 
I don't know how it's going to happen, but I know that we're going to know when to start. And folks, when those harps begin to strum and the voices begin to rise, the Bible, the, the description of it, it was like thunder, melodious thunder. Now, when God says thunder, you better believe it's thunder. It is a sound that uh, shakes the celestial glories of Almighty God. Singing the song of Moses. Hallelujah. What are these saints singing? And what song is it? And what are the words? The Bible says, and they sang the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. That's Revelation 13, 15, 3 there. Now keep in mind, the scriptures already stated plainly that some that sang before his throne, these who, in fact, those who are redeemed to sing it, have already learned this song because those that are in heaven, the, the heavenly beings, can't learn this song. Now, I've, I've heard it said, well, they're going to sing the song of redemption because the angels were not redeemed. But it's more than that. It's not just the song of redemption. Not at all. It's more, it's a song of the greatness and faithfulness of the Lord in the midst of fiery trials and overwhelming troubles. It's not just the song, I've been redeemed and saved from sin. No, no. That's only half the song, and I'm going to prove it to you tonight. Moses' song is a two-part song. Many have many know the first part of the song, but many have lost the second part, the, the part that's going to be sung around the throne of God. I'm telling you now, Moses his song went great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty, just and true are thy ways, thou King of Saints, Revelation 15, 3. But it's, it's, it's much, much more than that, and I want you to follow me closely enough, if you will, please. The song of Moses is a two-part song. One part comes to us as Christians, as believers, almost naturally. It's a spontaneous song that wells up after the victory comes. Now, you have heard my sermon, Right Song, Wrong Side. I preached that years ago in this pulpit. I, I turned on the radio, and I heard a man preaching Right Song, Wrong Side. And I said, that's my message, word for word. <laughs> he didn't say a word. He said it was his. I don't care who preaches it. It's truth. This is the song that's sung on the victory side. This is the song of Moses that was sung after the children of Israel were delivered. Now, one day before, just a few hours before the victory song, they were murmuring and they were complaining. I want you to go with me to Exodus 15, if you will, please. Exodus 15. This is where the first part of the song is uh, shown to us. Exodus 15th chapter. First six verses. Are you with me? You ready to go? Then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song unto the Lord and spake, saying, I will sing unto the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse, the rider, he's thrown into the sea. Isn't that a wonderful song? The Lord is my strength. We sing it here in song. He's my song. He's become my salvation. He's my God. I'll prepare him a habitation, my father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his host hath he cast into the sea. His chosen captains also are drowned in the Red Sea. The depths have covered them. They sank into the bottom as a stone. Thy right hand, O Lord, has become glorious in power. Thy right hand, O Lord, hath dashed in pieces the enemy. Hallelujah. I have heard that song in this church. I heard it tonight. For many of you, because God has accomplished something a few days ago. You were in uh, pain. You were in a problem, and the Lord has delivered you, even though you murmured and complained about it. In his mercy, he delivered you, and now you, you clap so loud tonight. You had your hands up. Wonderful deliverer. It's wonderful. Folks, those are nice words. That's fine. But just a few hours before, the Bible says, 
they were saying these words because there are no graves in Egypt, Moses, if you've taken us away to die in this wilderness? Why have you dealt so with us to carry us out into, out of Egypt? Been better for us to serve the Egyptians. We should die in this wilderness. That was their song. But now the Bible says they saw the Egyptians dead upon the seashore. All the problems ended now. Glory to God. What a wonderful song. Miriam danced. They all played the tambourines and playing their harps and singing and shouting and praising God. God is victorious. And God looks down and says, three days from now, they're going to sing the same old song. They're going to lose the song because they're going to get thirsty. I'm going to test them again. God knew exactly that they didn't have the right song. Oh, they had the right song, but it's on the wrong side. They should have, if they had sung that on the other side, the testing side. Mm -hmm. I, I preached Sunday night. Did I preach Sunday night? Yeah, Sunday night called Turn Off the Stew. I had a lady come back. She said, boy, Monday morning I went to work and I got a call. And boy, the fire was on. I was, how many of you got tested this week, huh? How many of you already got tested? Uh huh. How many of you turned off the stew? How many of you able to sing in spite of it? How many of you still had your song? They went three days, Exodus 15, they went three days. The Bible just, the song has just ended. The song has just ended. And in verse 22, it's just ended in verse 22 to 24. They went three days to the waters of Mer, and the people again murmured against Moses. They lost their song. Oh, how quick do you lose yours? Do you even get home from a service? Now, most believers have sung the Victory Side song, and, and many times that the Lord in his mercy uh, delivers them from their trials, but that is not the song that is going to be sung around the throne of the Lamb. That is not the song of Moses. Now, you, it says song of Moses, but that's the first part. That's the part that is sung here on earth. God hears it. God, God thanks you for it. He thanks us all. We're to praise him and love him in a victory. God receives it. He'll, he'll not turn it down if it comes from an honest heart. But how sad, how hurtful to God it has to be that so many of his beloved lose their song when things go wrong, when financial problems pile up, when sorrow and pain and suffering comes among children or family or on the job or in the career, and when the rent is past due, and when things are looking so bad, and maybe there's slander, and there's difficulty, and there's trouble upon trouble. How many grieve him? How many hurt the heart of God by thinking, maybe not saying, but thinking, God, you have not heard me. I go on month after month and year after year in loneliness. I have emptiness in my heart. I don't feel, Lord, that you've been faithful to me. I don't feel like you're answering my prayer. When things have gotten so tight and there's trouble in your life, beloved, I want to tell you something. We've not arrived in New Jerusalem yet. We're not there. Our path goes right through Babylon. We're not living in New York City. We're living in Babylon. We live in Babylon. I'm not talking about just New York because I'm talking about any Christian in this sin-cursed world now. This is Babylon. And there are going to be tests, there are going to be trials, there are going to be persecution, there are going to be trouble, there are going to be things you don't understand. There are going to be times of disappointment and disillusionment. You're going to have these times. Christians are tenant. Bible said many are the afflictions of the righteous. Many. I, I, I was reading some of the letters that come to us from all over the world, and t today so many letters I was reading say, Pastor Dave, would you please preach more about suffering? We're suffering. Tell us why and how we can bear with it, and please give us some meat. We're not getting it from our pulpits. We are suffering, and we don't know how to handle it. 
in Psalms, don't turn there, but Psalms 137, the first four verses, the children of Israel now are in captivity at Babylon. And it says of them by the rivers of Babylon, there's where we sat down, yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. We hanged our harps upon the willows in the midst thereof. For they that carried us away captive required of us a song. And they that wasted us required of us mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. But how shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? Now, I've dealt with this in another message. I told you what I thought of this scene and what the Holy Spirit was speaking to me about. I don't see the Babylonian soldiers coming to them, uh, you know, with a sword at them saying, stand up and sing and dance like somebody's got a gun and shooting bullets at your feet making you dance. Not at all. Excuse me. These Babylonian soldiers have served gods that left them empty and cold. They were calloused and hard and there was nothing to life. There was no joy. There was no victory. There's no peace. There's nothing. They served dead gods and left them dead and cold and empty inside. And the whole Babylonian society satiated with pleasure and sex and money and greed. And it's left them nothing but emptiness and sorrow of heart. And they've heard of these followers of Jehovah God that he put a song in their heart. That they would dance and they sing these joyful songs. All the heathen world knew of the wonderful songs that came out of Zion. They were called the songs of Zion. They danced by it. Even the heathen gathered around and, and, and were, were marveled at these people in their hardships going through a desert that could still sing. And they, I don't believe it was sing or die. I, I, I believe it was a plea. Please sing a song of joy. Please prove to us that there are still a people on the face of this earth that have a God that can keep them in their hard times and put a song in their heart that everything is black. I think there was a cry that said, if you don't show us, there's no hope. If you can't sing in a dark hour, please sing us one of your songs. Dance for us. Show us some joy. Here they are hanging their hearts, God's people, with all the promises, with all the blessings promised. God himself saying, I have you in the palm of my hand. And these people saying, how do you expect us to sing what we're going through? And how many, I've heard that in this church. I've had people say, I can't sing. I'm dead. I'm dry. I'm empty. I'm a blank. And that's exactly what the world, that the, what the job is saying to you and everybody around you. They're not wanting you to come into their presence on the job and wherever you are with a long face and mourning as if your God is dead. The cry on the job and on the street and everywhere else, no, oh, where is a God that can keep you in sorrow? Where is a God that can keep you a song when you're hurting and when you're down and when you can't pay the rent? Where is the song? Otherwise, they, 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 they finally, they see them hanging up their heart. By the way, where did you hang yours? Was it when the last time you cried and it wasn't answered? Did you hang your hop, hop up there? Is it because God's still testing you and you hang it up and then you say, Pastor, you don't expect me without, if you knew what I'm going through, how do you expect me to sing and be happy? And so the Babylonians looked at these Israelites in their, their downcast condition. They say, your God, what a God you serve, just like ours, dead. You have no more joy than we do. There's no testimony. Folks, the only testimony, you can go out and spout all the scriptures you want. You can, you can lecture people about living in sin. You're not going to get through to them until they see in you, no matter what happens, they see you trusting your God and singing us all, no matter how dark it gets. Hallelujah. Now consider... The other part, the second part of the song, 
the part that has to be learned, the part that the redeemed are going to sing around the throne of the Lamb. This song is learned in the midst of, oh, it can only be learned in the midst of severe trial and temptation and tempest. Moses is now 120 years old. Now, that the other song was sung 40 years ago, the first part. That's a song that anybody can sing that has ever experienced any victory here on earth. But the song that you and I have to learn is this song that he gives us in the midst of the worst trial and temptations and sufferings in our life. And you have got to learn it now or you can't sing it then. Because you're not going to learn it just by being translated. The Bible says the song that the angels couldn't learn because they've never been tested. They've never been tried. Deuteronomy 31, 14, the Lord said to Moses, he's 120 years old now, and the Lord's already told him to go to Horeb. He's got to go, he has to uh, go right on through the plains of Moab and go up to the mountain, and the Lord's going to take him home. But Moses, in Deuteronomy 31, 14, said, the Lord said to Moses, the days approach that thou must die. And the Lord appeared in the tabernacle in a pillar of a cloud, and it stood over the door of the tabernacle. I want you to go to Deuteronomy 31 now, and I want to show you what he was shown. A devastating message came from God. Deuteronomy, can I hear the leaves turning? 31st chapter of Deuteronomy. I presume most of you are still in Deuteronomy. I begin with verse 16 with me, please. And the Lord said, now, now, look, look this way for just a moment. The Lord appears in the tabernacle in a cloud of fire. And out of this cloud of fire, this is what he says to this man who had given 40 years of his life. I mean, he, he had literally laid down his life for this people. And here's what the Lord said. And the Lord said unto Moses, Behold, thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, and this people will rise up and go warring after the gods of the strangers of the land, whether they go to be among them. And they will forsake me and break my covenant which I have made with them. My anger shall be kindled against them in that day, and I will forsake them. I'll hide my face from them. They shall be devoured, and many evils and troubles shall befall them, so that they will say in that day, Are not these evils come upon us, because our God is not among us? And I will surely hide my face in that day for all the evils which they have wrought, and that they have turned unto other gods. Now therefore write ye this song for you, and teach it to the children of Israel. Put it in their mouths that this song may be a witness for me against the children of Israel." Now, this is a prophetic song, a warning. When many evils and troubles are befallen you, this song shall, be, uh, shall testify against them. It shall never, ever be forgotten. Now, look at me, please. Moses wrote the song out, and he wrote the music. There, there was a tune to this, evidently, and he taught it to the people. And he, and, and just before he taught it, or right after he taught it, he added these words. He said, I know your rebellion and your stiff neck. Behold, while I am still yet with you this day, you have been rebellious against the Lord. How much more after my death? For I know that after my death you will utterly corrupt yourselves, turning aside. Evil shall befall you in the latter days, because you do evil in the sight of the Lord, to provoke him to anger through the work of your hangs. And then he said, this song is going to be a testimony against you. This is going to be a song. Now, folks, the words of that song are still here. They're before us now to learn because he said this is for the latter days. It's for our generation right now. And it's a warning from the Lord. He said, when you get tested and tried, he's trying to tell Israel, he's telling the spiritual Jew that we are now. He's saying they're going to, there's going to be a time when you're going to be tried. There's going to be a time of trouble such that the world has never seen. It's going to be tested and tried. He said, many of you, when I prosper, you're going to turn against me. That's exactly what's happening even today with the prosperity message. People get, they get their money, they, they turn away from the Lord, they don't fast, they don't pray, they don't seek the face of God, and they go dead and empty. And when they get all of these things that their heart craved for, they have forsaken the Lord. No more intensity for Jesus. 
He said, that's, there's a, there's a song that's been written already to warn you. Be careful when I bless you. Be careful when I prosper you. But be careful, especially when hard times, when you suffer. Listen to it again. When many evils and troubles shall befall you. Listen to the words of this song. Don't accuse the Lord of unfaithfulness. Don't accuse him of having forsaken you. Be careful what you think. Be careful what you say in his presence. Because you would anger a God who's given himself and his promises to you. And you would not believe him. He said, it's your unbelief that will bring my anger. And then because of your unbelief, you will bring other greater evils upon you worse than ever. Folks, I take heed to that first stanza of this song. You, you cannot learn the song of Moses. You cannot learn this song to be sung around the throne until this really lays hold of your heart. I, I cannot just spout things off. You say, well, didn't Jesus say, Father, why have you forsaken me? <clears throat> that was just, I've talked about this, this sudden human response, but it has to be dealt with. And Jesus didn't go out that way. He quickly said, into your hands I commit, I commend my spirit, lest the people's thought around him that he'd given up on his father. No, his last words, into my, into your hands I commit my spirit, my soul. I commit everything to you, my father. I trust in you. Before the whole world, his was a testimony of trust. And until you understand this part of the song, I cannot. God will not allow me in my trouble to go morning, day after day and complaining. He will not permit me to mouth off in me these thoughts and these words that Almighty God who gave His only Son would abandon me, does not hear me, does not see me. It is the height of unbelief, the height of despair. It's a slap in the face of Almighty God. And the Lord doesn't take it lightly. Oh, the Lord doesn't mind that immediate, sudden, human response. But you have to lay hold of that and say, no, 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 no. And I want, I want to take you just a little further into it now. In the night, Psalms 42, 8, David said, in the night, his song will be with me. In the night times, the hard times. Psalm 71, David said, Thou which has shown me great and sore troubles, you shall quicken me again. You will bring me up from the depths. In other words, this pit of me. God, you're going to bring me up. Oh my God, unto thee will I sing with a harp. Because I know you're going to bring me out. Hallelujah. Now, you see Moses now. He's leaving and he's on his way to the mountain. He's, he delivered this first part of the song. He said, now, be careful what you say from now on. I'm going to be gone. Be careful what you say. Saints of God, this is the message to us. Walk softly when you're in hard times. Walk softly. Don't even think that he's left you. Don't even think for a moment he doesn't know where you're at. He's counted every hair on your head. He knows every thought. He has put a wall around you. He knows how far the devil can go and no further. He knows how to bring you out of temptation. He knows the end from the beginning. He knows all things, and you've got to understand that. And until he works, until he moves, be careful. Be careful. Folks, I have the holy fear of God on me now and as I walk before him in this. And, and this... Once you have this holy reverence and fear of God in this area, then it opens up something that you'll see here in just a moment. So beautiful and powerful. You see, some people have never learned to sing in the rain. But see, this man is on the way to Mount Nebo, humanly speaking, had every right to be discouraged and downhearted and questioning God. Look, how would you like to pastor a congregation of 
possibly 3 million people, and you take 600,000 men at least, and their wives, it, it, it would probably be another five or 600,000, uh, and then all the children and the grandmas and the grandpas, uh, many estimate as many as 2.5 to 3 million, but at least 600 men and uh, 600,000 men, and you give your soul, you give your life, you're up night and day ministering, and, and he's got to admit, ever since I've known them, the whole time I pastored them, they were stiff-necked. They were hard. This, this man has probably suffered more than any man on the face of the earth to the time of Christ. Can you imagine? He buried probably a million and a half people. He had to bury one time 17,000 at once. Mass graves. He had to weep over people who murmured and complained. And now after all this, God has told him, he says, they're, they're, they're going to backslide. They're going to go into the land. Even their children are going to backslide. They're going to go and possess the land. They're going to get fat and rich and they're going to forsake me. Now this man, humanly speaking, had every right to say, oh God, why didn't I stay up in the wilderness with those sheep? Why couldn't I have just been shut alone with you in a secret closet? And at least I wouldn't have had this heartache. No, 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 no. Moses, in spite of all around him, he doesn't look back because he's learned a song. And he learned it so well that God said, I'm going to choose this song. This is going to be the song that all the overcomers are going to sing around my throne. It's the song of Moses. I want you to go now to the 34th chapter. And here it is. Verse 26, beginning to read. Now here's the song of Moses. And this is the song we're going to sing around the throne of grace. Uh, around the throne of Christ. There is none like unto the God of Jeshurun. And that's the new Jerusalem. Who rideth upon the heaven in thy help and is in his excellency on the sky. Folks, let these words sink in. The eternal God is thy refuge. Underneath are the everlasting arms. And he shall thrust out the enemy from before thee and shall destroy and shall say, destroy them. Israel then shall dwell in safety alone. The fountain of Jacob shall be a, upon a land of corn and wine and the heaven shall drop down dew. Happy art thou, O Israel, who is like unto thee, O people saved by the Lord, the shield of thy help, who is the sword of thy excellency. Thine enemies shall be found liars unto thee, and thou shalt tread upon their high places. Hallelujah. Now let's stop for just a minute before I close, and let's go in detail to this song of Moses. He says, God shall ride upon the heavens to your rescue, number one. That is what we're going to be able to sing then. I have proven, I have tested God, and when I was in trouble, and I thought I was going down, I held my faith, my confidence in Him, because I saw Him on a white horse. The Bible said He will ride to my rescue. That's the song of Moses. Moses said, oh God, do I almost forsake you? I have proven, every time I was in trouble the last 40 years, you came to my rescue. You delivered me. <laughs> Hallelujah. Not one of my enemies triumph over me. My brother and sister rose up against me, but you delivered me. All the enemies, the kings, all around me rose up, and you delivered me. I trusted in you, O oh God, because I saw you riding to my rescue. Part two. Underneath me are the eternal arms of the everlasting God. Underneath. Moses said, are the everlasting arms. I may not see them sometimes, I might not feel them, but by faith I accept what he said. I have my arms. I come riding my horse to your rescue. In my time, and my way, he's not one second early, one second late. And when you think you're about to fall, you fall nothing but into his arms. Unto him was able to keep you from falling and present you faultless before his throne with exceeding great joy. His arms are under me. He shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings thou shalt trust. 
Part three, he will deal with your enemies. He shall thrust out all your enemies from before thee. Verse 29, your enemies shall be exposed as liars. You know who those enemies are? Demon powers that whisper in you, you're going to fall, you're not going to make it. And those people who slander you around, God says, I'm going to expose all that. And folks, if you trust God in your hard times, God will expose every lie of the devil. He'll start exposing one after another. And that's what, that's what you're going to see and that's what you're going to hear from the Holy Ghost. He said, I'll expose all of your enemies as liars. Glory to God and said, I'll be your strength. I'll be your arm. Now, there's something I've, I've got to say. Again, no man, the scripture said, could learn that song, but those which are redeemed from the earth, they learned the song on earth. They learned it through their testing and their trial. Now, folks, learn it tonight. You, it's something, now, to learn means it's a knowledge or skill obtained, obtained by study and experience. What you learn is what you get through study and experience. Day after day, you practice it. It's not something you learn at one time. I have to get up every day when the enemy comes in like a flood. When trouble comes, I have to lay hold of this song. It's not something I sing out loud. It's that still, small song, that voice inside that's ever singing psalms unto the Lord. And singing to his faithfulness and saying, Lord, I resign to your will. I resign. You'll not let anything happen to me, but such is right. Because you're a loving father. I turn my kids over to you. I turn my family over to you. I turn my job to you. I turn this church to you. I turn everything in my life over to you. I resign to the will of God. And I believe you will bring me out. And I will sing of the faithfulness. And when I'm in the darkest trial, I'm going to sing. You will ride to my rescue. Your everlasting arms are under me. You will cause my enemies to be dispersed. And you will expose all the lies of the enemy. And I will be your strength. And I will be your song. Learn it now. How in the world do any of us expect to spend our time here, and with this I close, we spend our time here in a hard time, and we murmur and complain, and we doubt, and then we fear, and we accuse God. Do you think suddenly you're going to be translated, and somebody put a harp in your hand, and they sing, sing? You'd be singing a lie. Because you didn't learn the song. You didn't learn the song. I'm learning it. And I tell you, it's bringing a peace to my soul this past year through the word. Folks, maybe nobody else in this church is getting set free, but I'm getting set free, free by the word that Pastor Carter's preaching and what he's bringing to me, a peace and a calm like I've never known in all my lifetime because it's truth that sets you free. Folks, I, I don't try to fix anything anymore. I don't try to work anything out. I don't care how dark, I don't care what the trouble is. I said, oh God, I'm going to sing your song. You know where I'm at. You're on your white horse and you'll come running when you're right on time. You won't move until you know it's time. But when it's time, you will be there and your arms are there all the time. I'm not going to fight this. I'm going to rest. Do the problems go away? No, but the Bible said, he, he, he says right here, he, he says, thou shalt tread upon their high places. And what that means, I'm going to lift you up above it all. They're going to lift you up into the heavens. You're just going to trust me? <laughs> you think you can work anything out? Forget it. Forget it. You're just going to mess it up. Oh, I, I used to be that way. I'll fix it. And I'd get on the phone and... The more I talked, I just put kindling on the fire. No, 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 not anymore. God help me. Now, I'll be tested. I got I, I to gotta dig in on it every day. But here, here's the song. The Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song. He's become my salvation. He's my song. Hallelujah. Stand. <clears throat> Don't lose your song.
You know what I pray? <clears throat> Choir? Church? I pray you got convicted out of your song. The blues. <clears throat> and God convicts you by his spirit and his word. That no matter what you're going through tonight, you say, oh, Jesus, forgive me for doubting you. Forgive me. That's true repentance. Oh, how he loves to see his people trust him in the hard times. That's our testimony to this world. Folks, people don't know it, but we're on the brink of a great shaking. He said, go shake everything and be shaken. You better learn the song. Learn it now. See, if, if you learn it in the, in, in, in the little easier lessons, it, it gets, the song gets stronger and stronger, gets better and better. Until finally you get such peace and the devil gets so mad because he can't get you stirred. He can't rile you. Hallelujah. Holy Spirit, I thank you for your holy word. Your pure word, O oh God, that comes from your heart. Only to, if you convict us, it's only to deliver us, to bring us into a sweet rest. Lord, the only way to enjoy you is to resign to you. There's no other way to enjoy you but to resign to your perfect will and say, here I am. Do what you will with me. Do what you please. Do what you please. You'll not leave us begging bread. You'll not forsake us. Lord, you'll test us. You'll try us. There'll be suffering. There'll be hardship. Sometimes tremendous hardship after hardship. But you said, I'll be with you through it. I'll see you through. My arms will always be under you. Hallelujah. The everlasting arms. I'll always be under you. Lord, I want to sing the song of Moses all through the rest of my life so that when I get around the throne of God, I won't have to be taught. I will have learned it. I will have learned it. Hallelujah. If you're here tonight, up in the balcony, you'll go to the stairs on either side and come down in the aisle. But do you need to repent of even this feeling that you have lately. I don't think you'd want to accuse him of anything, but there's just a sense, oh God, what's going on? Some of you need to repent tonight. If God's dealing with it, I want you to come. Now, if you're backslidden, you need to come also. But no matter what your trial is, if you're going through suffering and difficulty, and maybe you've lost your song, you said, brother, if, I, 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 I just don't have the joy. I don't have the, the real joy of the Lord in my heart. I want you to come. I'm going to pray for you and believe the Lord to restore his joy to your heart right now. Amen. This is the conclusion of the message. Redeemer is coming to Zion. Heavenly Father, if we knew tonight how close we are to the coming of Christ, if we really knew how short our time was, we would not hear, we would not be sitting here so nonchalantly in your presence. There would be a detachment from the world. There would be such a hunger in our hearts. We would be lifted out of ourselves into the very presence of God. Oh, Holy Spirit, I invite you to come now. Take over this service in a supernatural way that no flesh should glow in your presence, but that we would hear from the very throne of God. Oh, Holy Spirit, minister your word. Minister to us, Lord, and give us hearing ears that we could hear what the Spirit would say to us. In Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to bring you a prophetic word from the Lord tonight. The Redeemer of Zion 
is about to appear in his glory in our day in his church. And the Redeemer shall come to Zion, and unto them that turn from transgression in Jacob, saith the Lord. Now, the vision of Isaiah the prophet is about to be fulfilled. God is about to move with vengeance toward all who twisted the truth of the gospel and all who have become covetous. Isaiah spoke of our day. He spoke of the conditions in the church of the last days. He said, truth has fallen into the street. Yea, truth has failed. And he that departed from evil maketh himself a prey. And the Lord saw it, and it displeased him that there was no judgment. And Isaiah is saying to us right now, let it be known that God is angry. Truth is being twisted and trampled upon. The church of Christ has become victimized by those who preach false doctrine. And God is displeased because no one will stand up and judge the perversions of truth. No one standing up to judge the perversion of truth. And it displeased him that there was no judgment. God's ministers were sitting idly by while the truth was being thrown to the ground and trampled upon. Lying spirits had found a voice in the church, and no one stood against it. True men of God refused to judge the false doctrines creeping in. Therefore the Lord said, I'll judge it myself. The Redeemer of Zion is going to come, and he's going to judge the carnality. He's going to judge our wickedness. He's going to judge our covetousness. And he's going to judge all the mockery of the truth of Jesus Christ in these last days. And he, the Lord, saw that there was no man. And he wondered that there was no intercessor. And he said, where are the men with discernment? Where are those who will show the people the truth? Because truth is falling Few people care, few people understand. And the Lord said, I wonder why. Where are the men who stand up and discern? Show my people the truth. The Redeemer himself is about to clothe himself with vengeance, the Bible said, in zeal. And he's going to move quickly to his church with fury and holiness. For he put on righteousness as a breastplate, and a helmet of salvation is on his head. And he put on the garments of vengeance for clothing. And he was clad with zeal as a cloak. According to their deeds, the Lord says, I will repay. He's coming back to his church. Even now, the Bible said he's putting on the uniform of a glorious captain. He's coming wearing a breastplate of holiness. And he said, there's vengeance and there's fury and there's judgment. For the Lord shall judge his saints. The Lord shall judge his people. Something new, something awesome, something eternal is about to happen in the house of God. He said it's going to be sudden, it's going to be glorious. Now you've heard that the Bible predicts that in the last day everything that can be shaken will be shaken. But let's ask God now by the Spirit for an understanding. Why is he coming to his church with vengeance and fury? And why must the Lord himself return to Zion? Why is the Lord going to take the matter out of the servant's hand, out of the old minister's hand? He's going to take this matter of defending his truth. Why is he going to do it in his own sovereign power? It's all clearly laid out by the prophets. First of all, the Redeemer is coming to Zion because the enemy has come in like a flood against the church. The enemy has come in like a flood. The Bible, Isaiah said, when the enemy shall come in like a flood. Satan in these past few years, especially the past five, maybe ten at the most, has been flooding the church with one new doctrine after another. There's been a spirit of covetousness and carnality. Satan has poured out a demonic flood of adultery and morality and filth. John the Revelator saw it coming. This is what he warned us. 
And when the dragon saw that he was cast to the earth and persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child, and the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood, this flood of Satan is all at war against the true church, against the overcomers. And the dragon was angry with the woman and went to war with the remnant of her seed, which kept the commandments of God and who have the testimony of Jesus Christ. We are witnessing right now the devil's final attack against the chosen, the very elect. The Bible said he will seduce, if it were possible, even the chosen of God. And Daniel suggests that for a season he'll prevail. For a season he'll be successful. The horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them. He prevailed against the saints until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High and the time came that the saints would possess the kingdom. I ask you now, is Satan prevailing for a season right now? Come on now, in the United States and Canada, I tell you, for a season, Satan is prevailing. You and I know that the gates of hell will never prevail against the church of Jesus Christ in the end. But is he prevailing for a season now? Has Satan established a beachhead in the church, a stronghold? Are many, many of God's chosen being deceived? What happens in the church to this woman in the wilderness? The Bible says, until the Redeemer comes with fury and vengeance. Satan will come with another gospel, the Bible says. And Paul told us exactly how he's going to come against God's holy people to try to deceive them. We're not talking about homosexuals and drug addicts now. Talking about overcoming saints of God. Talking about preachers of the gospel. For Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it's no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness. Oh, that's awesome. Many will come in these last days who are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. Satan's stronghold in the church in the last day is a host of teachers and ministers who have been transformed by a gospel of the flesh. They have come to us as the Lord's most enlightened ministers. They sound just like the preachers of the gospel. They freely use the name of Jesus. They speak of righteousness. They use the scripture. They cast out devils. They heal the sick in the Lord's name. They do many wonderful works. But their message is not of God. It's another gospel. It's a deception. It's of the flesh and it's not of the spirit. And many of these teachers have been so deceived by the devil, they're blind to what they preach. They're preaching lies and they believe it to be the truth. They're not even aware they're the tools of Satan. Do you understand that they are men who started out right, but they're transformed by the gospel they're preaching? It's doing something in them and to them. And right now, these false doctrines of Satan are prevailing in the church in many areas. Multitudes of God's people are flocking to conventions and meetings to hear this other gospel, this gospel of self and prosperity and success. The gospel of the flesh is riding high in the church. Come on, Christian, wake up. Are you and I being deceived? Have we been trapped into the teachings of an angel of light from Satan? Are you being swept away by this flood that the prophets told us would sweep the church and for a season would prevail? Get into God's Word and hear the true gospel of Jesus and begin to judge now what we see and hear and compare what Jesus said to what they are saying. The Scripture proves beyond a shadow of a doubt that Satan's new flood his new gospel is gain is godliness. Gain is godliness. Listen to this. 
clearly, if you don't hear anything else I say, hear this now. It's a compromising message without repentance and, or godliness. It, re it promises forgiveness without repentance. All we offer people now is forgiveness. Turn on your television and listen. Happiness and forgiveness, it's all offered freely. No repentance. It's a gospel of gain. It's based on the supposition that the godly you are, the more gain you will have. Oh, listen to Paul's frightful warning. If any man teach otherwise, even other than the words of our Lord Jesus, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, that man is proud. He knows nothing. He's destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness. Paul cried out, turn away from them. Turn away from this other gospel. Do you want to hear the true gospel, Christian? Do you want to hear what Jesus really said in this day and age of success and prosperity preaching? Do you want to know what the gospel says? Are you interested? Here it is from the words of our Master himself. Blessed be ye poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are ye that hunger, for ye shall be filled. Blessed are you that weep now, for ye shall laugh. Blessed are ye when men shall hate you, and they shall separate you from their company, and they'll reproach you, and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. Now here's what the Gospel says about people in these modern times in the church who are seeking after material things from the lips of Jesus himself. Woe unto you that seek to be rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe unto you that are full, for you shall hunger. Woe unto you that laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Woe unto you when all men shall speak well of you, for so did the fathers to the false prophets. The gospel of gain despises poverty. It rejects and despises the poor. Listen to what James said. He said, but you have despised the poor. You say unto him that's prosperous and dressed best with the gold rings and the fine apparel, sit up here in the good place. And to the poor you say, sit here in the low place. Sit at the footstool. This is a gospel of partiality to the prosperous and successful and it's an indictment against the poor to whom Jesus ministered. It exalts prosperity and success. James said, Are you not partial? Hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom? And for you preachers of the gospel who try to tell me that he became poor, that we could become rich in houses and lands, you don't know your Bible. There it is. It said, Hath not God chosen the poor? Rich in faith! How blind is the church today? How blind! Is this the gospel for a dying world? Gain is godliness. Faith is for prosperity. Poor people lack faith. Christ became poor so that we could be rich in material goods. He came to give us abundant life. Is abundant life supposed to be worldly goods? No, that's eternal life. Abundant life is the fullness. You and I don't have the life. We have just the seed. The life is encapsulated in that seed. And one day we're going to have abundant life, and that's eternal life in Jesus. We don't have it now. We're going to get it then. One billion people on this earth are near starvation. The heart of Jesus is breaking over the sight of weeping mothers who hold starving babies with their bloated stomachs. Millions are unemployed. The ends of the world are coming down on us. The world's headed for Armageddon. Our cities in America and Canada are about to explode again in riots. Persecution and tribulation are coming. The Bible said the elements are going to melt with a fervent heat. The world's on fire. 
All over the world, God's chosen people are being jailed. They're being persecuted. They're losing all they possess. They're taking joyfully the sporting of their goods. And you tell me that God's going to send a man of God to tell me that I have a right to be rich? Is that a man of God who comes to me in the face of a starving world and said, use your right, use your faith. You can be rich, you can be prosperous, you can have a bigger car, you can have a better home. What's happened to us? How blind can we be? You say that's an American message. No, it's keeping all over Canada right now. We got it all wrong. The rich man went to hell. The poor man went to heaven. From such turn away. These preachers have no burden for repentance. They don't preach against sin. They offer blessings without sorrow. They are accumulators of this world's goods. They accumulate. Heard a preacher say, I have to be successful. I have to drive a nice car. I have to prove what I'm preaching. Makes me want to cry. Amos the prophet cried out, Woe to them that are at ease in Zion, unconcerned about the evil day ahead. They lie upon beds of ivory. They stretch themselves upon their couches and they eat the lambs of the flock and they drink wine in bowls. And they are not grieved for the afflictions of Joseph. They're not grieved. And I shudder to think of standing before the judgment seat of Jesus Christ. Having preached that kind of a message. The Redeemer is coming back to Zion to break down every stronghold of the state of Satan. And he's coming back to Zion to raise up a standard of truth. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will raise up a standard against him. What is this standard that's going to swallow up the flood? What kind of sovereign fury is going to be released very soon in the church? Folks, it's a sovereign fury. You can put all your books on Finney away. hundred ways to have revival. Put them away. This is a sovereign work of God to be released in the church. What is this vengeance the prophets are talking about? Hear it. It's the actual presence of God. The actual living presence of God. The church in these last days is going to experience God actually appearing in their midst. And the Redeemer shall suddenly come to Zion. That's the church. He's always come suddenly. He came suddenly at the day of Pentecost. He came suddenly to Paul. He comes suddenly, folks. One day it's not there, the next day it's here. He's going to suddenly appear in his actual presence. This time the judge is coming himself to the church. The general of the armies is coming. He's coming in power and awesome glory. Now you and I know that wherever two or three are gathered in his name, there he is in our presence, in our midst. But folks, that's like the ray of the sun compared to the heat of the sun. The closer you get to the sun, the brighter and the hotter. And the Lord said he's going to remove himself out of his chamber and he's going to suddenly come forth. He's going to appear in his church. The Lord will come who will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and he will expose the counsels of the heart. Every preacher in this building, listen to me. Every evangelist, every missionary. You and I know God's not going to raise up a new prophet. The days of big time evangelism are over. They're over. Babylon's coming down. All the men who shine, they're not going to shine anymore. All the bigness, all the brightness, all self glory is coming down. And the Lord is going to appear in Zion's midst. 
There'll be no new revelation. Folks, there's no new revelation coming. You say radio, we've had radio for 50 years now. We've had millions and millions of sermons on radio and the world is still lost and America's undone. Television, no television is not the answer. That's a part of it, but that's not going to do it. We've had that now for 20 years and still didn't do it. No, we've had the best preaching in the history of the world. We have the best churches. We have all the machinery. Oh, no, no, folks. There's only one hope. There's only one hope left, and that's the awesome presence of God. God breaking through everything and coming in His presence to the church. We are going, we, I, I prophesy right here and now we're on the verge of a revival of the actual presence of God. The Holy Spirit's going to open the eyes of His people. He's going to pull the scales from our eyes. And you and I are going to come up against the terrifying presence of God. The earth shook. The heavens dropped at the presence of God. Even Sinai was moved at His presence. And the Lord whom ye seek Folks, you understand that we're so deaf and dumb and blind now we hear this and don't hear it? We have ears to hear and we don't hear. But I've heard it and I believe it. The Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple. He shall come, saith the Lord. And who's going to bear up on the day of his coming? Who shall stand when he appear? You know that all the preaching of gain is godliness is going to melt in his presence. All the pride of success, all the secret hidden sin is going to melt like wax before the presence of God. The Bible said this wax melteth before the fire, so let the wicked perish at the presence of God. For he is a refiner's fire. He shall sit as refiner and purifier of silver. He shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. The first thing he's going to do, folks, when he appears in his church again, he's going to work on the ministry first. He's going to sit as refiner of fire, and he's going to purge Levi. This is the ministry. And folks, I tell you, the day is coming. Whether we want it or not, he said, I'll manifest myself to those who weren't even seeking after my name. And God said, I'm going to remove out of my place and I'm suddenly coming to my church. And oh, he's going to come in a melting power. Who's going to stand on that day? Who's going to glorify himself on that day? Who's going to talk about the church he built or the ministry he's established? I don't care if you pastor the biggest church in the world. It's not going to mean a thing in the sight of God. Doesn't matter. All idolatry is going to come down. For behold, the Lord shall come forth out of his place. He will come down. He will tread upon the high place of the earth. And the mountains shall be molten under him. And the valleys shall be clipped as wax before the fire. Isaiah said, oh, that he would rend the heavens, that you'd come down, that the mountains might flow away at your presence. As when the melting fire burneth, the fire causes the water to boil, to make thy name known to the adversaries, that the nation may tremble at his presence. Jeremiah cried, Will you not fear the Lord? Will you not tremble in his presence? God said to Ezekiel, And all the men that are upon the face of the earth shall shake at my presence, and the mountains shall be thrown down, and every wall shall come tumbling to the ground. Oh, every wall coming down. Listen, if the ungodly were going to shake and tremble in his holy presence, how is anyone going to stand in the presence of God in his house? How are you and I going to stand when he appears? He said every wall is going to fall to the ground. Down comes all the boasting, all the books and teaching on success. Down comes all the idols of self. Down with self-promotion. Down with merchandising the gospel. 
down with all the thieves that are trading in God's house. This house will be a house of prayer, no longer a den of iniquity. No more seeking after the things of this world. No more squandering your faith on temporal things. No more trying to make a name for yourself because judgment's going to begin in his house. His presence is going to frighten and melt everything in sight. He's going to humble his servants. No minister will be allowed to boast in his presence. It's going to become fatal. Listen, it's going to become fatal to harbor secret sin. I believe we're going to see many whose flesh is going to be destroyed that their soul may be saved. People are going to die in the house of God once again. That no flesh should glory in his presence. You say, how can you preach like that, Brother Dave? Very easy. I've had an experience like Paul had and Peter. I heard my summons a few weeks ago. And he told me of my time of departure. And at that moment, I renounced the world and everything that's in it. And from that moment I knew what he said when he said, Many, many shall come on that day and saying, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Have we not cast out devils? Have we not healed the sick in your name? And he'll say, I never even knew you. And the other side of that coin is, You never knew me. Do you understand that? Not a few, but many, many, many who have built churches who have had ministries around the world and they were so busy they didn't take time to know him. And it suddenly dawned on me if I have my summons, there's only one thing left in this world that matters and that's to really know him. To know him because you and I have to stand before the judgment seat of Jesus Christ. Do you understand that, folks? We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ to give an account. And God's made it so clear to me he's interested more in winning all of me than he is in my winning all the world for him. Until he has all of me, I don't know him. And I tell you, the time is coming soon that God is going to break through in our midst. Preachers are going to get up and confess their sins publicly. I've already seen it happen. I received a call of a revival that broke out in Chicago. It's happening there. It's happening in California. And day is coming. You will not be able to stand in the presence of the Lord. You will fall on your face and you will confess your sins and no flesh will glory in his presence. You're going to have to flee like Jonah from the presence of the Lord. You won't hold your secret sin any longer. How many times has the Holy Spirit dealt with you? How many times did he say, lay it down? And the only reason you still flirt with it because you have not yet come into his awesome presence. I hear people say, oh, the Lord is moving in our midst. We have seen and felt the presence of God. Folks, you and I don't know what we're talking about. We don't know what we're talking about. If God was really in our midst tonight, I would be the first one down on my face. I couldn't preach. Every man behind me would be on his knees saying, God, I am nothing. I have nothing. I'm nothing. None of us could stand in this house. No one could go another minute without confessing, lifting his hands, crying out to God. Your head wouldn't be in the air. It would be in the dust. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up. His train filled the temple, and above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face, and two he covered his feet. Do you understand that the seraphims couldn't even stand to look, so they covered their eyes? They were so ashamed of themselves, they covered their bodies. They didn't want him to look, and they couldn't stand to look in his face. With twain they covered their eyes, and with twain they covered their bodies. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. 
the whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. And the message is, See the Lord and die. See the Lord and die. All success, all self-esteem, all secret sin, it's all going to vanish in his presence. It's going to turn to corruption. Daniel said, I lifted up my eyes and I looked and behold a certain man was there clothed in linen and his loins were girded with fine gold. His body was like burl. His face had the appearance of lightning. His eyes were lamps of fire. And his arms and his feet like in color to brass, polished brass. And the voice of his words were like the voice of a multitude. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision. For the men that were with me saw not the vision. But a great quaking fell upon them, so they fled and hid themselves. Therefore I was left alone, and I saw this vision. There remained no strength in me, for my comeliness was turned to corruption. I retained no strength in me. Yet I heard the voice of his words. When I heard the voice of his words, then was I in a deep sleep on my face, with my face toward the ground. And when he had spoken these words to me, I set my face upon the ground and I became dumb. Couldn't say a word. When the presence of God comes in his house, people are going to stand and confess or they're going to melt and harden themselves. We're going to cry, woe is me. I'm not a success. I'm not a winner. I'm undone. I'm Jacob's worm. I'm a proud man. I'm a proud woman. I know nothing. I have nothing. But for his blood, I'm damned. But for his grace, I'm damned. And then you'll learn to cry out with Paul. He's chosen the weak things of the world, the foolish, the nothings that no flesh should glory in his presence. Now finally, the Redeemer's coming to Zion to prepare his bride for the wedding. To prepare his bride for the wedding. Blow a trumpet in Zion. Gather the people. Sanctify the congregation. Assemble the elders. Gather the children and the infants that suck the breast. Let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber and the bride out of the closet. Blessed are they which are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. For his wife hath made herself ready. She is arrayed in white and fine linen and righteousness. People, let me tell you what the real gospel is. This is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is this. Put on righteousness. Lay aside every weight and the sin that easily besets you. Don't become entangled with the things of this world. Go forth now to meet him. Get your lamps burning. Get your oil supply. Don't set your affection on things below, but on things above. Don't lay up treasures anymore here on earth. That's the gospel. tell you why the Redeemer has to come to Zion with his presence because the church is not ready to meet him. We're not ready. There's too much hay, wood, and stubble that's going to burn. God made this so real to me. He's been speaking to me night after night. Saying to my heart, I've got to come back to Zion. I've got to have people face my presence now. Lest there be no hope for them when they stand there. Because, folks, if we don't allow the fire of his presence to burn out the dross, if we don't allow him to burn out the sin and the pride now, how do you stand before him? I had a beautiful, last week, a beautiful six-hour experience in the Spirit when he laid me down and said, come, the Spirit said, come. And I found myself racing through the universe, past the stars, in an outer darkness, 
but there was no fear because I was racing further and further out into eternity. And suddenly the world was so small, there was nothing left. It was nothing but a speck out there in space. And the further out I got toward his presence, away from the world and all of its beggarly elements, the more I was crying, I'm nothing, I'm nothing, I have nothing, I've done nothing. I could feel the utter nothingness, the emptiness, and I could say, it's only grace, it's only mercy. That's all I have, grace and mercy. And that's when the Lord said, David, there's something more important than your ministry even, more than your family and everything else, and that's to know me. To know me! We have to have this presence of Christ revealed to us now before we go to judgment, and we cannot stand there. What's it going to be like to stand before the judgment seat? It's a private chamber as far as I'm concerned. Forget the masses this time. You can put them at the great white throne. And just he said, I stand one at a time at the door of your heart and I knock. You're going to wait outside his chamber, Christian. And he said, some of us are going to suffer loss. Do you remember when Satan took Jesus to the mountaintop and showed him in an instance all the powers of this world? He said, you can have it in an instant there before his throne. And you'll know as soon as you enter that presence and he opens that door and you're ushered in and there's nothing there in that chamber but the judge, Jesus Christ, the judge whose eyes are a flame of fire and you suspended in space. Nothing, no place to stand. Nothing but his grace and his mercy. And he shows you all you've done. And in a moment of time, he builds your world again. And he shows you your motives. And he said, see, you said to my glory. But it was to your pride. You built your empire and not my kingdom. Every secret sin, all that was confessed, but still holding, clinging on, besetting you, vexing you. And that's going to be the greatest revelation of grace that you could ever receive. And how many, many thousands in the church of Jesus Christ and even ministers, because that which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination of time to the Lord. Some of the greatest known men on this earth are going to stand there naked with nothing, nothing, nothing. They're going to be stripped naked. And they're only going to say, mercy, Jesus, mercy. Oh, you'll get his grace, but you won't get his glory. I want more than grace. I want the glory. Jesus said that they may see my glory which the Father has given to me. Folks, he's going to manifest his glory. We're going to glo go to glory with glory in our hearts. The glory is coming back to his church. And when that glory appears, remember what Jesus said to, to Mary. He said, didn't I say to you, if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? Folks, do you want to spend your faith on something worthwhile? He said, didn't I tell you, if you'd believe, if you had faith, you'd see what? Material blessing, know the glory. That's when we'll spend my faith. God said, you're going to see my glory. You're going to see my glory. I've already touched it. I've already felt it. Do you understand that your cars that you drive 20 years from now, said Jesus, they're going to be on a heap somewhere, just rusting away. Do you know that your house and everything you own is going to melt? Do you know the only thing that you have now that's worth anything? Is the knowledge of your saving love and grace. That you and I have nothing more to give to Him but our love. I will glorify the house of my glory. Arise and shine, Zion, for your light is come and the glory of the Lord is upon you now. And that glory shall be seen upon thee. 
that glory shall be seen upon you. All oh, people are going to see it. What was that glory that Mary and Martha saw? What was the glory? It was resurrection power. They saw the man come out of a tomb. Folks, after all these years, he's finally seen fit to show me what his resurrection power means. I'm not talking just about that day that he's going to come for us and take us out of the grave. Oh no, folks, I'm talking about resurrection power right now. I'm talking about being raised from the death of self and pride. I'm talking about being transformed into the kingdom of God where your soul is possessed with Jesus, where you want nothing more in your life than to truly know you are glorifying his name, that every word you say and everything you do is pointing to his majesty and his glory. We need a resurrection, a revelation of his resurrection power in the church right now. I've canceled all my meetings. I felt led of God to take this one. I've got next week three more and that's it. And for the next five months, I've got a little prayer chamber and I'm going to wait because I'm repenting. And I'm falling on my knees. And I'm saying, oh God, how many times you've come to me and said, now, make your move. Go all the way. Humble yourself and seek my face. And how many times we go so close and then we quit and we say some other time. And I'm so grieved at what I've seen around the country and around the world. I've preached in some of the largest Assembly of God and Pentecostal churches in the world in the past six months. One pastor of a large church told me he hadn't prayed in one year. He has devotions every day, but he doesn't pray. We've got men so busy running around the world trying to win the kingdom for God. But where are those? Where are those who shut themselves in and hear that sound? of the trumpet. You understand, people, you and I are not ready. You're not ready. Now, folks, I can say some things now because I've got nothing left to lose. I've got nothing to prove to anybody. I've already been given my divine detachment. We're here now in His unbelievable presence. And I'm going to bring you what I feel the Holy Spirit told me to tell you. And this is the reason I came. Maybe you're not relating to everything I'm saying yet. The first of the Pentecostal Summers of God in Canada. If all the leaders and all the pastors and all the people, lest you and I repent, you're going to remove your candlestick going to remove it. And you pick him up a people who are given totally to his love. You put away your professionalism. You get back to the cross. You get back to the secret closet. You humble yourself. You go back to the meekness that you once knew. You go back to the sense of his sovereignty saying, not my will anymore, but yours. I've got a neighbor who got his summons two weeks ago. Well-known young singer in America, Keith Green. He lives next door to me. His plane came down, 12 people killed. 27 years old. I talked to Melody, his wife, the other day. She said, He got on the plane and said, Honey, if I don't come back, raise Daniel for the Lord. And suddenly he goes up. Fifteen seconds later, he's down. The plane burst in flames. The body's dissolved. 
Couldn't even identify the bodies. <laughs> oh, folks, we live like we're never going to die. There's some pastors here tonight that need to repent. In just a few moments, he's going to move closer. He promised me that he'd give us just a little taste of his presence. He's going to appear among us. He's not going to let you sit in your seat comfortable anymore. He's going to bring you back. In the moment you feel his spirit breathe on you, Humble yourself. Just come and stand in His presence. Say, Jesus, I want to know You. He's going to tell you, you did so much in my name, but you didn't take time to know me. You didn't take time. You so busy, you didn't take time. You became a stranger to me. Use my name, but you didn't know me. I don't care whether you think I'm a mystic or not. Because I'm just as much at home over there as I am here tonight. I've already seen his face. I don't want anything this world has to offer. Oh, I'm going to... Occupy till he comes for me. I'm going to work. But you understand that you haven't been given any more time. You've only been given the hour that you're in right now. You don't have a promise of getting out of this building. Every one of you could be summoned tonight. Now you think about that. If I only had four or five more hours to live... And I go into the judgment chamber. And I appear before the judgment seat of Jesus Christ. I'm not going to stand. He said that you may be presented faultless with exceeding great joy. That's what he wants. The Lord wants on that day to reach out and say, Come on, my child. Come on closer. I know you. You know me. We are one. Come, my brother. Come, my sister, into my presence. Folks, that's what I want. I want him to embrace me on that great day. I want to be embraced by the Savior himself. I want him to reach out of that judgment seat and say, David, come closer. My son, come closer. Because he said, you're going to be known even as you know. What you're doing right now depends 